Welcome to Canada's podcast, the number one podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Canada's podcast. Today, we're going to meet Peter Feist, who's the founder and CEO of Staffy and maintains, as he said, a reputation as a bon vivant. He has a diverse experience uh, and, you know, worked on some very complex uh, projects in, across North America. He was president of Netcon, an elite network security co company, and he's a graduate of Next Founders, which is a tremendous entrepreneurial uh, uh, group. Uh, he studied programming at Sheridan College and completed one year of culinary training at George Brown. So, uh, you know, a pretty mixed uh, background. So, so Peter, welcome to Canada's podcast. Let's kick off as a youth and by, you know, just, just give us a, you know, a quick overview of who, who Peter Feist is and, uh, and what you're doing at the moment. Kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Peter Feist. I am the founder of Staffy currently <laughs> and for the last five years. Uh, prior to Staffy, I was a senior security architect working in the IT industry. Um, and, um, you know, I, I thought, I, well, I, I came on to the idea of Staffy uh, accidentally, actually, uh, which we can talk about later, but, um, you know, it's been a very, very interesting journey. I uh, have a passion for wine and audio uh, and good food. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I follow politics a little bit and, um, you know, I have a lot of uh, hobbies that keep me occupied when I'm not, you know, working uh, on 19 hours a day on Staffy. <laughs> so, you know, we were talking earlier, you know, you said you had a great, you know, you had a great career, you know, got paid a lot, didn't do much. And, <laughs> and, and then you jumped in to being a, a, an entrepreneur where, you, you know, you don't got paid enough and you, <laughs> you, and you work nonstop kind of thing. Mm hmm are we wired differently? Why? Why are people? Why? Why? why that doesn't make any sense. If you think about that, you know. You know that's a that's a great question. But I've always kind of been an entrepreneur slash inventor, and I've never really worked for anybody else. But I did have managed to have a great career in IT, and um, you know, like I was I was well compensated, and I didn't have to work that much, and. Um, you know, when I, I stumbled on the idea of Staffy, like I said earlier, um, but it was such a brilliant idea uh, and it wasn't a cliche before that I just had to, you know, it, it, it got me to my core and I just had to do everything I can because I thought this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to really make a, a difference and to make a change and to accomplish something. And, and I, you know, in IT, I, you know, I'd done some pretty cool things. I'd, 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 um, you know, I set up one of the first wireless uh, networks in North America, really, you know, way back when. Um, and I was, uh, you know, we, we, I basically, my job was to prevent hackers from attacking corporations. And, um, and I, you know, I was traveling around quite a bit and um, uh, I had a really good, good life. <laughs> and then I decided to give that up to uh, start a company really. So, so, you know, how did you actually get started? You know, people, dream of starting a company they might have ideas and it's you know curious to i'd like to find out how people actually get got started you know it's thinking and then doing uh, it's a big jump yeah so um so i was i was i don't know i was i was uh i was skimming over an article about an entrepreneur in toronto um that had um uh, that I got confused about what he was doing. So I was skimming over this article and I saw shifts and on demand. And I associated his name with the hospitality industry because his brother works in hospitality. So I conflated the two of them. And I thought, wow, this guy did the Uber for uh, hospitality, which wasn't a cliche at the time. It was before the Uber of X wasn't a, you know, wasn't a common phrase heard. Um, but I thought, man, what a, what a brilliant idea that is. And I'd worked in hospitality, you know, uh, between the ages of 19 and 24. And I worked in Mississauga as a, you know, a bartender and a server and a, a bar back and had some of the best years of my life, frankly. Um, and, um, and so, 
you know, and I thought of this idea is like, it's such a great idea because absenteeism is such a, is such a big problem in hospitality. And we originally started as a platform that um, basically solved the absenteeism issue for, for restaurants. Um, and so when, when I stumbled onto this idea, I, I read the actual article and he hadn't done anything of what I described. He'd done like a module for this application called When I Work and wasn't anything to do with what I'd imagined he'd done. So I called up my buddy, Victor, who was the proprietor of the best restaurant in Toronto at the time. And I said, you know, hey, hey Victor, listen, if there was an app and your line cook called in sick and you could get somebody in 90 minutes to replace them, would that be useful to you? Um, and he swore at me and he said, that's the most brilliant idea I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> and I was living in Vancouver at the time. And so, um, there was, there was a bunch of very fortuitous meetings, uh, shortly thereafter where I knew some, you know, I had, uh, in, in Vancouver, I knew a few people, um, that knew a few people and I, I ended up meeting this, uh, this guy that had had uh, wrote the one of the first online uh, gambling um, uh, apps uh, w- way way back when, and um, he, he's a great mentor and I still talk to him today. But um, you know, when I started developing the idea, I wanted to do everything. So I thought, you know, just not line cooks or dishwashers, but what about tradespeople, healthcare, education, construction, all those things that depend on uh, somebody being there and not calling in sick and all the things where there's, you know, there's not, there's generally a middleman taking advantage of everybody. So, you know, the agency model where they charge a lot of money and they pay staff very poorly, or, you know, if you want a plumber and why are we paying $150 for a plumber, you know, pay some company when we could just pay the guy like 40 or $50 and, and, you know, he's happier and we're happier. So that was the, really the genesis of, of the idea is how to disrupt the, that, that predatory middleman that's, you know, present in many industries. And I was really adamant about, um, about doing everything. <laughs> so I wanted to launch this platform where you could sign up as really anything at healthcare education, a teacher, a uh, construction worker. And uh, my mentor said, you know, that's, that's impossible. <laughs> you're going to spend a lot of money trying to do it and you're going to fall flat on your face. And I, I couldn't conceive of why that was true. Um, but luckily I, I, I got the book called Lean Startup and quickly realized how accurate that was, which is a, is a great book. And I recommend it to anybody in a very mm-hmm. early stage. Um, and so, you know, my mentor taught me two things and he said, you know, one is to do one thing and do it really, really well, which actually no longer applies in, in today's world, today's COVID world. And um, the other thing you said is to build a, a business before I built an app, because, you know, as I thought of the idea, I had gone out and find out how much would, be, would it, you know, how much would it cost to create an app? And I was getting anything from $50,000 just for wireframes to a million dollars for a fully functioning app. And, you know, we, I didn't have any money. And um, so um, basically we, he, he, he proposed that we use like a, just like a 1-800 number basically. Um, and people could call or text. And um, we also had to solve the chicken and the egg problem. So how do we have uh, staff before we have clients and how do we have clients before we have staff? Um, so um he then, you know, he then suggests I go and talk to a bunch of people. And because I'd been working in IT and because I'd been well compensated, you know, I spend I spent most of my time in restaurants um, drinking uh, good wine and eating good food. And so I knew all of the proprietors in Toronto or many of the proprietors. And I had a, a pretty good reputation. I was a good tipper. Um, and um, so when I when when I, when we thought of the idea, I basically went to all of them. I, you know, it was probably twenty or thirty or so. And I said, "What do you think is the idea? And would you be a first customer?" And almost to a number, they said, "That's the most brilliant idea I've ever heard." And of course, we'll be your first your first company your first customer. And and oh yeah, what about surge pricing? Like when I need a dishwasher on a Friday night, you can just charge me $25 and I'm not going to care. <laughs> so that was, um, you know, so we, um, I, I actually launched Staffy while I was living in Vancouver in Toronto. So I launched it remotely. I um, were, you, were you still working? I mean, did you still? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone sort of, that, one of the things that people, you know, they have an idea, they want to do it. 
but how, you know, the money side of it, that you know, they got family or this, or you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So we, I, I managed to raise some money from friends and family um, uh, pretty, uh, pretty quickly. Um, you know, after we had kind of developed the model and then decide how to solve the chicken and egg problem. So we hired like a couple line cooks to basically sit around and just wait for shifts um, and, or wait for calls. Um, and we, you know, we tentatively launched on the November 2nd, but we started getting our first request on November 1st as like an on-demand solution for absenteeism. And of course it was a dishwasher, um, that called in, that called in sick that we needed to replace. Um, so, I mean, I didn't, it, obviously it wasn't enough, uh, business to sustain, to, you know, to be able to draw a salary from. So I think it was about two years before I, um, before I started working on Staffy full-time and I very much was, you know, um, trying to do, trying to manage a career and trying to start the startup as well. Um, and, you know, it's very challenging sometimes because I, I you know, I, at one point I was working in an office and I was getting calls from clients and I didn't know what to do. And, um, you know, I, we didn't have enough money to be able to hire like staff full time yet. Um, so it was, uh, it was, um, yeah, it was very, very, very tough, uh, for a long while to manage that, you know, my work life plus my startup for sure. So, you, so you've been running startups for about five years. So, I mean, what's the best thing about being an entrepreneur versus, you know, having a job kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and you have something that you love, then you're really, really passionate about what you do and all of the accomplishments, I mean, as well as the, you know, the not so, uh, not so great things about being an entrepreneur, but, uh, you know, you feel really uh, directly. And when you are, when you're in a career, you're kind of doing things for other people for the most part. Um, whereas when you're an entrepreneur, you're really doing things and accomplishing things yourself. And it's a lot more rewarding. It's a lot more stressful. Um, and, um, you know, um, I, I think I have a lot more gray hairs than I did five years ago. But, um, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a very, very, very different world. Um, uh, but it's, 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 it's far far more rewarding because you're directly responsible for everything that happens what's the greatest challenge you've faced in the last five years um i think i think well i think um canada and and my challenge in canada has been uh fundraising that's been the biggest challenge for 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 us um because we weren't like a sexy SaaS marketplace or a SaaS uh, company that had this like, you know, um, all of these, you know, uh, metrics that they can take and measure. We were a, a staffing marketplace, so mm -hmm. uh, not as attractive and it more, it's all transactional versus uh, recurring and, you know, it's less, um, less popular in Canada and there are very few investors in Canada. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I've been, a, I, I was a solo founder and I, I think that would, that would really worked out for probably the first two and a half, three years. But, you know, towards the third year, I realized why a, um, uh, a co-founder would have been valuable. And I did try to have a co-founder right, right away. But you basically one person can r run the company and one person can fundraise. And I didn't have that luxury. So it was kind of like a, uh, a vicious circle of I can't raise money because I have to run the company. I can't run the, you know, I can't. Uh, run the company if I'm if I'm trying to raise money, and so you know we've been b basically bootstrapped the entire time, and we you know we've done well, so um, I think we'll hit close to uh, close to or an excessive uh, an excessive uh, twelve million in sales this year, um, but yeah, and um, and so we I mean we managed to bootstrap it, but it was very very that was the hardest part of 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 our journey and my journey is bootstrapping the company because yeah. um it just makes things a lot more stressful like i you know i was man like you you worry about being able to pay people and um 
you know, it's just, it's a, it's a very, very tough thing to do. That, that was sort of one of the things I was going to ask you, you know, we face unexpected challenges as entrepreneurs. Uh, and I, I talking to, to a lot of them as I do, you know, I'm interested to know, I mean, you've obviously hit some during the last five years. Have you kind of found a way to, to manage them when you hit that challenge through the last five years? Is, is there some kind of method or is it just like, ah, you know, yeah, it's exactly that. It's like, yeah, what do I do? Um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. And then you, you know, you start throwing the wall, see what sticks. But um, uh, in my previous career, I spent a lot of my previous career being a troubleshooter, actually. Mm -hmm. So I would figure out constantly how to solve sometimes very complex uh, uh, challenges, technical challenges. Mm -hmm. And I really think that benefited me in, in my entrepreneurial journeys because I never relied on anyone to solve my problems. I always, uh, I always took on the challenge myself, uh, and um, and so when I when I encounter issues in in my business, I always uh, I always work very hard to solve them, and are often you know I'm often um, you know able to do that. I'm also uh, um, uh, uh, very optimistic person in general. Um, so I always think that I can do things uh, no matter what. So I have uh, a lot of confidence and, uh, you know, most of the time it actually works out and, and sometimes I can't. And so, and that's when I, you know, I, I ask other people to help, but, um, you know, it helps eliminate a lot of the, uh, um, a lot of, helps us get through a lot of problems by, you know, using my team and, and, and having myself to solve issues that we encounter. So if you could go back in time to your 20-something self, um, uh, what advice would you give yourself back then? My 20-something self or five years ago when I started the company? Uh, 20-something, a, a little before that. Are you moving into the workforce, really? Um, yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I've had a pretty good life. Um, and uh, I've really, you know, if, if, if everything culminates or has culminated at this point in my life where I'm, I'm running this, you know, what I think is an amazing company yeah. and we're doing amazing things right now, uh, I'm really proud of the journey. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't really, wouldn't really change anything or give my 20-something self any other advice you, except... You think it's been a good journey? Up there. I've had a... I've had a yeah. That's a good thing. I've had a know, good time. You mentioned a mentor, and I, I think, at least in my life, uh, there's, there's been two or three people that have, that have really kind of given, made a lasting impression on me, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. What's the best piece of advice that you've received from a mentor and that you've used on a continual basis? Kind of thing? Yeah. Um... So, yeah, I think I mentioned them earlier. One was, you know, in a practical sense to build a business before you build an app, because you have to demonstrate the efficacy of the model that you're planning mm -hmm. on, on executing mm -hmm. and, um, you know, to, you know, go out and survey the, the clients was, was super useful. So uh, practically those were really good at, you know, that's, that was really good advice. And then the, the stick to one thing and do it really, really well was super important because it took me a, a while to realize how significant that is and how trying to take on too much is, uh, you know, is a disadvantage and not, not an advantage. And, you know, we were, we were turning down lots of different companies early on um, because we didn't want to spread ourselves too thin. Mm -hmm. um, and even though, you know, I really wanted to chase after this big chunk of business because it was guaranteed income, it was just not, not our core function. It didn't make any sense. Um, but that being said, um, so we recently pivoted from, uh, hospitality into healthcare and general labor. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was curious about how we, you know, and I, I talked to my mentor, I said, you know, when, when we first started chatting, you said to, to pick one thing and do it really, really well. 
and now you know we're doing all kinds of different things and it's not really that that same motto and he said well the answer is that is that we're in a completely different world than we've ever been in, in a, u- a unique span in our, all of our lifetimes and the old rules no longer apply which is you know really quite true and so um you know we've been able to pivot uh, uh, pretty successfully um, and, um, you know, thankfully, uh, save the business and actually, uh, uh, succeed and do better than we we've ever done before. But, um, you know, those were really the, the, the great pieces of advice. And, and, uh, one more recently is to just, um, um, I don't know how to put it, but, um, basically you just have to always, um, you have to always remain calm <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. and um, not show uh, how frustrated or um, upset or angry you might be with something and just always, you know, remain a cool head, uh, have a cool head when, when dealing with people. Um, not that I'm prone to not having that, but sometimes, you know, th- things that an entrepreneur can be very frustrating and, but always remaining calm and, and, and putting your best foot forward is always, uh, you know, I think is great advice. Um, and, um, you know, a a very valuable uh, lesson. So if you weren't doing what you were doing, what you're doing now, would you be doing the same job or would you, is this that you were in IT that you were doing beforehand or is it something else that you would be doing? Um, I would probably be doing the same job quite honestly, Mm -hmm. um, unless I thought of something better. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'd probably be living on a, living on a beach somewhere <laughs> rather than in the, in the great white North. Uh, you know, I do love it here though, but, um, you know, I would, I would probably be, uh, have a lot more leisurely lifestyle, I think, which would be, which would be great, especially now. I mean, um, you pivoted because of COVID really, I guess with hospitality yeah. and everything else. And you've done it successfully. I mean, uh, you, you know, what can you, I mean, and you said it's because rules of the past are no longer rules of the present kind, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Is there some other things that you could, you know, to, to, our, to our listeners, viewers, many of whom are entrepreneurs who are probably scratching their head and saying, oh, shit, you know, what am I going to do now? Is mm-hmm. there anything that you could sort of pass on to them in terms of that pivot advice brought on by where we are um, that, that, that really kind of m- might help them take a similar path kind of thing? Um, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity right now um, because the world is changing so quickly. And, um, you know, we were able to succeed um, and get customers that would probably have normally taken a year or two um, to find and and develop the relationships with and, and, and get contracts signed. But because everything is changing so quickly, you know, we had contracts signed within a week kind of thing. Yeah. And so I think you have to look for the outliers uh, right now and where the opportunities exist. And we, I mean, thankfully, we kind of stumbled on to ours. And um, I'll, t- I'll tell you what happened. So um, um, right around, so previous to COVID, we had been building our company for about four years. Um, and we'd finally got to the point where we were starting to become pretty successful and get contracts with a lot of uh, larger and larger clients, basically. And um, um, and we were even starting to talk about preferred vendor agreements with some of them. Uh, and then COVID hit and basically destroyed 98% of our business, almost literally overnight, um, wow. right around the time... Um, um, Doug Ford had announced the um, uh, state of emergency mm-hmm. and um, we were, you know, so everything stopped. Um, basically we were expanding into the U S that stopped fully because we were going into airports and, you know, there was like 
no more flights, basically. Right. Um, we, you know, we were, we were dealing with hospitality and events. So all of the events stopped, all the restaurants closed. Um, and, you know, our, our, our revenue dropped to, you know, 5% of what it was, uh, or two to 5% of what it was, um, wow. you know, just a few days before. Ooh. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was wild. And, um, I was trying to think of what we were going to do. And, um, at the same time, I was, I'm a frequent user of Instacart and I noticed that the dates, um, the delivery dates were getting further and further out. So first it was, you know, 12 hours, then it was a day, then it was two days and it was five days. Then you couldn't even get an Instacart order. Mm -hmm. And what it made me realize is that there's going to be a lot of companies that are much busier because of COVID as opposed to having their businesses decimated like in hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, so the Loblaws, the Sobeys, the um, Costco's, Canadian Tires, the Amazons, um, all of those companies uh, I thought would be much busier because of COVID and I ended up being luckily, luckily right, but also um, uh, healthcare companies as well. So um, although I thought it was going to be, I didn't think COVID was going to last this long. And, um, but I felt we had an obligation to the staff on our platform to try and find them revenue because they had just lost a hundred percent of their income basically. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I started reaching out to, I was literally, I literally emailed Jeff Bezos at like 2 AM in the morning. Cause I thought I'd get him like up, up and working or something. I emailed all of the CEOs of all the biggest companies I could think of, like Canadian Tire, Costco, yeah. uh, Loblaws, Sobeys. And we started talking to some of them. Um, but the most traction we got was, was in healthcare. And basically we were able to repurpose the healthcare, the hospitality staff into healthcare. So a dishwasher or a line cook might work as a, a, a housekeeper or a cleaner, a server or bartender might work as a dietary aid. Um, and then, um, basically, um, once they became familiar with our model, they started asking us, or I kind of haphazardly offered that we could maybe think about finding them nurses and, uh, PSWs and healthcare aides. And man, we had within like a few days, we had 400 requests for all of those positions That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> and because long-term care had been deeply affected by you know where they're losing 30 percent of their uh, their staff uh basically so we were able to close a number of contracts very very quickly um because um we had reached out so aggressively and uh um you know eric who's my number two guy um, we literally did everything we could. We were working like 16 or 18 hour days. Um, and we, you know, the funny thing is we, we weren't trying to save the company because I thought it would be short lived, but, you know, because COVID has been so, has lasted so long, we actually saved the company itself because otherwise we would have probably had to close down, um, if we hadn't pivoted. So I really think it's about finding those, you know, um, opportunities for, um, those opportunities are outliers where um, people haven't thought of something before because everything is changing so quickly. So there's so much happening right now. And then there's, you know, unique opportunities to work alongside government and, and all the red tape has gone away because everybody's just trying to find solutions to problems and they have to do it quickly. Okay, just, just, just getting close to the end, a couple, couple of less intricate questions. Mm. Are, you a, are you a morning or a night person? Uh, definitely a night person. I really, uh, even nine o'clock is kind of early for me. <laughs> <laughs> I generally block out my calendar before. It's six o'clock, isn't it, for you? Okay. Oh my God, no. <laughs> and I'm used to, I, I, I usually work till about, um, you know, 1 a.m. or so. Yeah. Uh, and I go to bed and I, and I, I do wake up like six and I work for a little bit and then I go back to sleep. Yeah. Uh, and then I generally work up, work around nine o'clock and then I, I do a workout. Um, and I start my day around 10. And um, yeah, so I'm definitely not a uh, definitely not a morning person at all. If you had to pick one word to describe yourself, what would it be and why? Uh, tenacious, um, because I I never ever give up, um, and it, it really came from the background of uh, you know previously when I was a um, a troubleshooter is always 
I think of it as a, like a challenge, like every, every problem is a challenge to see if I can solve it. And so uh, a lot of people describe me as having a lot of tenacity and it's because I, I, I never stop and I never give up. And I, you know, I always make sure I get things done and I fix things or. or... What book are you currently reading? Um, what book would you, you know, you, you already recommended one book, but. Is it, I mean, what are you reading and what, what would you recommend that you've read recently? Um, I honestly have not had any time to read anything uh, uh, in the last probably year or so since COVID hit. Um, uh, I read the internet. <laughs> That's about it. But I, I usually read, you know, two a month. I'm, I'm down to about oh. one, one a quarter at the moment. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, I, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I um, we have been, you know, flying by seat of their pants with with our pivot. We've grown easily 10x um, since pre-COVID, and um, unfortunately, I have, um, you know, I don't, I haven't had any time to read any books or even think about any books. I have a lot of books I'd like to read. Uh, the one, the uh, the one by Reed Hoffman, I really, I really like to read. Um, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's something about, you know, speed scaling or something like that. Um, but yeah, we have a whole library of, of books that we, we, you know, back when we were in an office, we had all this whole library of startup friendly or startup um, uh, centric books. Um, but now we don't have an office, so there's nobody around to read them. But, uh, okay. Scaling. That was the it's name. That would be interesting. Some, some, some great, great, you know, great input on your part with people. You know, um, how can people get you online? I mean, we, you know, you get people listening and, and they get interested and they sometimes want to connect, email, whatever. Um, what's the best way for people to connect with you? Yeah, right now is link, LinkedIn is probably the best way. My, uh, my email inbox is inundated every day right now. Mm -hmm. um, and LinkedIn is a lot less commerce. So if anybody wants to reach out or... Um, you know, if they want to get in touch with the company, we're at staffy.com. Yeah. Well, Peter, thanks very much for coming on Canvas Podcast. It's been, been a great meeting. Thanks, Phil. Uh, it's a pleasure. And, and thanks so much for having me. It's been great chatting with you.